Foreign Ministry of the Presidency, Mr. Sovdal. Uh, you, you have the floor, sir. Micro. Thank yeah. you. First of all, I would like to express uh, both on my own behalf and on behalf of the High Representative my most sincere and heartfelt condolence, condolences to all the parents and families in Belgium who have suffered such terrible losses in today's tragic as, uh, assistance in Switzerland. Our thoughts are with the families and friends of the victims and with the Belgium people. And after that, I turn to, to, to Russia. Mr. President, honorable members, it's me a pleasure to be here again today to di discuss with you the outcome of the presidential election in Russia on behalf of High Rep Representative Vice President Ashton. Let me uh, first of all thank Parliament for the strong voice it has consistently been giving to European citizens concerns about democracy, fair election and human, human rights in Russia. <clears throat> Russia is our largest neighbour. It's an important business partner, partner and indeed a strategic partner on many global and regional issues. So it matters to our citizens what the situation with human rights and the rule of law is in Russia. Parliament has followed both the Russian State Duma election on the 4th of December and the president, presidential elections on the 4th of March very closely. It has adapted several resolutions expressing the expectations of European citizens for Russia to live up to her international commitments to ensure free and fair elections. You have also given High Representative Vice President Ashton several opportunities to address the plenary on this crucial issue. In addition, several hearings have taken place since December on these elections and on human rights more generally, organized by the Foreign Affairs Committee, by the Subcommittee of Human Rights, by the Parliamentary Cooperation Committee with Russia, and by individual political groups. Catherine Aston has asked me to thank Parliament for all this important work. She also asked me to, uh, to in particular, convey the message that she shares Parliament's concern about the case of the arrests and death in pre-trial detention of lawyer Serga Manitsky. Restrictive issues are a sensitive instrument that should be considered in specific situations and in accordance with the respective EU guidance, guidelines. The European External Service, Action Service, is currently looking into options on how to convey our ex expectations that the investigation on this case is being taken forward properly. The Russian presidential election went largely as expected. OSCE and Council of Europe observers gave a clear evaluation. Chances were not equal during the preparations. Procedural violence occurred during the voting and counting process itself. We agree with the preliminary report and will remain Russia of its international commitments to free and fair elections. High Representative Vice President Catherine Ashton issued a statement the day after the elections with five main elements. She, recogni she recognized the clear victory of Vladimir Putin. <coughs> she noted international observers recognition of the significant civic engagement in these elections. She referred to international observers finding of ir irregularities. She encouraged Russia to address these shortcomings. She looked forward to work with the incoming president and new government on our shared modernization agenda, which should cover both economic and political reforms. 
Outgoing President Medvedev, the day after the elections, instructed the Prosecutor General to examine the verdicts handed down to 32 convicts considered by the opposition as political prisoners, including Mikhail Khodorkovsky and former business partner Platon Lebedev. The President has also ordered the Justice Minister to prepare a report on the legal reasons for denying the registration of Michael, Mikhail Kasunovs, Boris Nemtsov and Vladimir Rutskos People's Freedoms Party. These are encouraging signals. Next step. We have a strong consensus in the EU that we must engage with Russia. Critically, yes, but also constructively. Without Russia, we cannot solve the regional challenges in our common neighborhood in Syria, in Iran, nor most of the pressing global challenges such as climate change and the environment. The approach has been quite successful recently. With Medvedev and the government led by Mr. Putin, we have been able to build more constructive relations and to achieve results. Russian WTO accession is one key result that will bind this large econo economy into the international rules-based framework. The Partnership for Modernization is another one. Many projects have already been prepared and launched, including technical and regulatory modernization, as well as reforms of the judiciary and civil society involvement. We have also begun a process on common steps to be fulfilled before we could consider launching negotiations on a visa waived agreement. All of this will be to mutual benefit. The new civic and political awakening in Russia has already led to some political reforms, with the first Duma reading of a bill introduced by President Medvedev to liberalize political uh, party registration rules and presidential candidates registrations as well as to restrain direct elections of regional governors. The process is encouraging and will have consequences, especially in Russia's many regions. Change may be slower than one would hope, but we should have patience. It's a good thing that both authorities and protesters want gradual evolution, not revolution. A caution a cautious but real dialogue has begun between them. The quality and dynamics of the political situation in Russia have changed. The key issue for us now is how we can support this reform process. The bilateral initiatives just mentioned provide us with an excellent basis to build on. As Cathy Aston has stated, the EU looks forward to working with the incoming Russian president and the new government in full support of our shared modernization agenda. The next major stop in our strategic partnerships, apart from all the ongoing regular work, will be the next EU-Russia summit due to be held in Russia just before the summer. I thank you and look forward to hearing your views and to your resolution, and to your resolution that will be adapted tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and because I see that you have not had phones, I would like to announce uh, that I will be very strict in taking the time. Please, we have uh, not a lot of time available, and uh, I would like to ask you to be very sharp in, in your speaking time. Okay, for the discussion, the first speaker is Mr. Salafranca Sanchez Neira for two minutes. Gracias, Thank you, President. President in office, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen. The discussion we're having this afternoon on Russia is particularly significant. We need to take a position between what we want and what we can get. The resolution which will be voted on by this House tomorrow reflects the very specific circumstances after the recent presidential elections. We have, if you like, an official Russia, which is looking back with a certain degree of nostalgia to the Soviet period, which is 
important and uh, has a seat on the Security Council in the United Nations. And it is going to see the same President and the same Prime Minister in office, is holding elections which aren't in line with international standards, it's uh, R Russia where opposition figures are arrested, which brings us back to the inglorious recent past. But it's also a country that's part of the Council of Europe, the International, the World Trade Organization. It wants to be a member of the OECD. It's a Russia which has people, as in the Arab Spring, people who are fighting for respect, freedom and dignity. And that's the key element in our resolution, President. We want things to change. We want there to be a period of dialogue, talking to those members of the opposition whose rights are being ignored and trampled underfoot. We need the institutional framework. The, that's the new association agreement between the EU and Russia, and Mr. Swoboda's report is about that, who are two blocks that need to understand one another. I think that from our perspective in the EU, and I call upon the President in office and the Commission representative to do all we can, use all the influence available to us to make the, what we want possible and make sure that the fundamental rights and freedoms of all are actually respected, genuinely respected in Russia. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Mr. Svoboda. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, President. It's true. In uh, recent uh, weeks and months, we've seen two elections in Russia that couldn't be described as free and fair. There, have been, uh, there has been progress in these elections, but the progress has been slight and also to a degree through some of the high functionaries uh, has made their actions made it worse. In both cases, we saw problems starting with the registration of candidates. Many candidates who in other countries would have been admitted as candidates without a problem wouldn't, weren't even allowed to put their names, uh, have their names accepted as candidates. That's not acceptable. The conditions that are tied to becoming candidates were set in such a way that certain candidates just could not become, uh, have their names put forward. Then we have problems in the media as well. It wasn't a situation that there was a balanced reflection of the media, but uh, especially in the electronic media, because TV, of course, is very important. But if you look at the, the official uh, um, programs covering the elections, they were more or less officially shared out. But whenever Putin was there, he was saving the Siberian tiger. He was friend to animals. He was whatever. Uh, of course, that's indirect um, uh, grist to his mill. And there have been other forms of pressure in an indirect way so that we had to give a critical appraisal on the elections. That is, and this sub constitutes a, an advance in democracy in Russia, that there was a great deal of opposition. Now, Whatever we criticize, ladies and gentlemen, we can say that in Russia there is something we haven't seen before. People are going onto the streets in Russia. Some people are rejecting the actions that's, that are being carried out there. And of course, we should criticize the situation if certain demonstrators are uh, treated fairly brutally or uh, arbitrarily arrested. These are things we cannot accept. But I think we should see the demonstrations as a positive sign. There have been many demonstrations, and in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, the police did behave properly, although that wasn't the case, as I say, in all cases. But in any way, it's not the nth appraisal of elections that we're talking about now. We're talking about mention... Uh, we should be mentioning the opportunity that now exists in Russia. And I think that's the decisive element here. We can have another resolution condemning. That's not the purpose of this 
resolution, although of course there are some quite strong words of criticism in the resolution. In the resolution, however, we are talking about adopting a reform package, uh, uh, finally, that that should be done, calling to Medvedev uh, to uh, be able to stand up and say, I've done something in this country, I've got things moving, things that haven't been done in the past years are now being done. It's a chance for Putin, an opportunity for him to start his new presidency with a new reform progress, a uh, new reform program. Say, yes, I've been criticized in the past, but now I'm in a position to, be, to help Russia make progress in terms of modernization. It's a, an opportunity for the opposition that they don't need to just oppose, but they can actually influence as well. Surely that should be the message coming from this House. We want to work together and support the powers who are reform-minded in Russia. We know that Russia has to find a new path in this new millennium. Russia has to carry out its reforms. It has to become more democratic. One point is clear. Modernization without democracy cannot work. So we need more democracy in Russia and more modernization. That should go hand in hand. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Svoboda, uh, would you like to answer blue card? Okay, Mr. Migalski. 30 seconds. Thank you very much for accepting my blue card. I share your hope that the developments in Russia give some hope for optimism, but I don't share your opinion that the elections um, are, represent progress. I don't believe that. Do you not think, however, that the resolution that we're discussing now could have been stronger in message? We can see diplomats and they express their concerns about human rights with a stronger voice and maybe we haven't fulfilled certain expectations. Stadler? President. Uh, President. Uh, colleague, colleague uh, Svoboda, two questions to you. You said that the election in Russia wasn't fair or fry, free. There's a contradiction that your own party uh, comrade who, who was an uh, electoral observer in Russia, as I was, said in a press conference, the election was surprisingly fray, free and ex surprisingly fair. Second question, you criticized that in the uh, election campaign there was indirect uh, uh, campaigning in the uh, television. How do you uh, uh, explain uh, the uh, um, um, amount of uh, coverage given to your government in your own country. Keep the time. I would like to apologize. Just now, third blue card, and we will finish. Mr. Stas. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, President. I'm very pleased you've given me the opportunity to put a question to Mr. Swoboda. I was listening with great attention to your beautiful words, Mr. Swoboda, but can we really talk about elections? Elections really is, is, entails a whole process where there are certain rules that have to be followed, where parties are recognized. You have leveled all sorts of criticism, and the question at the end of it, are you prepared to recognize these as elections? Are you prepared to recognize Putin as a president of the Russian Federation in the full knowledge that we know that these elections were not normal, representative, free, fair elections? That's the essential question. Thank you very much. You have just now time for answer. Colleagues, as we see, there are different assessments. I'd just like to point out, it's not about our sensitivity, whether we uh, recognize the election or not. There's a chance now to um, take a re reform process forward. And if the opposition in Russia says we want to reform, and uh, we say you, you mustn't because that's the, the wrong system, then that that wouldn't be uh, election. Let's not be holier than the Pope. Let's help the election, uh, the opposition in Russia. That's the key point. Of course, we can uh, express much more criticism, but the question is, how can we help and make sure that the two sides come together? Because that's the, our main interest. If we want to have a partner in Russia, we want to have a partner which is strong and democratic. That is my objective. It's not about the past, it's about the future. And that's what the opposition wants to, to Mr. Stadler. There's nothing new in this, uh, uh, in this chamber. It's not about Austria this today, it's about Russia. You might not have noticed that. It's about Europe and Russia. That's the key point. And next time, uh, I hope that we can speak about really true, elec really uh, free elections. 
they weren't this time, but let's help them, uh, the opposition, with uh, Medvedev, Medvedev to uh, find a solution. Um, we won't be able to change Putin, but we'll be able to change the rules under which Putin can rule, and the, the, the opposition can do that with our support. Thank you very much, Mr. Svoboda. And just now, the floor, Madame Oyuland. President, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we are not uh, speaking about uh, Magnitsky, not about Khodorkovsky and other uh, cases, uh, but that does not mean that uh, we have been forgetting those cases. We will come back to those issues. We are speaking today about uh, the elections or so-called elections, the presidential elections uh, in, uh, in Russia. And uh, I must say that uh, yesterday the ALDE group in this parliament organized a very uh, good, uh, extensive hearing on the results of the presidential elections. We had Mr. Kasyanov uh, and Mr. Kasar Kasparov, uh, two opposition leaders here visiting uh, Strasbourg. They are also on the balcony here, who were delivering their first-hand experience uh, from these elections. Our president of the group, Mr. Verhofstadt, was also visiting Moscow on the 5th of uh, March after the elections. And uh, he was on the streets. Uh, he saw that the militaries, the amount of militaries on the 5th of uh, March was so enormous, what people haven't seen since 93. Speaking about these elections and fraud, what has been reported by the OSC and, and ODIR, uh, also the Council of Europe, uh, it shows that uh, it's, it's not really, uh, uh, how to say, it's, it's, ex it's extraordinary. They are even increasing the results from the Soviet times. But normally, the polling stations did not get the attendance more than 99,9 percent. No, they were 100 percent in Chechnya. It's, uh, it's clear that the, uh, the results, the, the conclusions are evident. So these elections were not free. These elections were not fair. And this is now the question to the international community. What does it really mean? What kind of consequences we should draw from this? Is this president legitimate? Is the Duma what was elected in the same manner in December? Are they legitimate? And how they can be a partners uh, to the European Union and the rest of the international community? This is the question. Thank you very much for your speech. Other speaker is Mr. Schulz. President, President, ladies and gentlemen, the Commissioner, the uh, election observers of the OSCE noticed that the uh, Russian elect, uh, presidential elections were neither f fair nor free. Uh, the domestic observers could see that the official uh, result wasn't correct. Putin's uh, election um, campaign people said that this is the uh, cleanest uh, election campaign Russia has ever had. It means then that um, uh, previous elections haven't been fully fair. That goes in particular for the um, uh, fraudulent Duma elections. Given the restrictive conditions and uh, the, the, the slant in the election, um, it was clear that uh, Putin was going to win. It was an election without uh, alternatives, a victory without uh, opponents, because um, the opponents weren't on the uh, electoral election slips. and uh, Rather, they were outside uh, opposing him on the street. Uh, it was to be foreseen that uh, Mutin um, would use the full force of the state apparatus and the media and would uh, win at the first round. You could win elections that way, but you can't win the trust and the future of the country. We need to note, but we, uh, we ought to um, ho hold ourselves back. Um, the the, uh, Russia has uh, missed a chance to uh, overcome the uh, uh, split in its society. Um, uh, otherwise, it will lead to f further flight of capital and pe people. Uh, Putin has been in power for 12 years. Uh, his promise of stability means stagnation. The uh, military renewal will lead, lead to a huge rearmament. The promised um, uh, economic and uh, societal re renewal uh, has, hasn't been seen. Uh, recent defamations suggest that his world picture of yesterday, his KGB methods, and his, um, he, he remains uh, a prisoner of his um, 
authoritarian system. So there are great expectations of the opposition. They must make sure that the street protests uh, aren't uh, uh, an empty ritual and uh, an empty appeal. Of course, uh, the political change must be led by c civil society in Russia itself. But we in the EU can support this process by, uh, on the basis of a new electional, electoral law and the admission of parties, a fair and transparent um, election campaign. We can um, meet the challenge of the protest movement and, and support uh, early Duma elections. Uh, that ought to uh, speed up the opposition and show that there is, there is an, uh, an electable op uh, alternative to Vladimir Putin in Russia. There is Mr. Koval. Thank you very much, President. I have an impression that today, being realistic and serious, we need to tell it as it was. What were these elections like? Perhaps we should not adopt any resolution if we are not able to distinguish between democratic and non-democratic non -democratic elections, elections that were not elections as such. So perhaps it would have been better not to have a resolution or just uh, encompass it in one sentence, stating nobody could be a candidate and these elections were not a democratic process. We need to be realistic in this way rather than uh, talk about things in empty phrases because people will be laughing at us. We are losing our position as the European Parliament and the European Union will not be treated as a reasonable and serious entity. So let us tell it as it is. Let us call, let us call it by the name. Perhaps it would be better to keep silent if we cannot do that. And secondly, we need to turn to those who go into the streets and to tell them that we understand the young people who protest. Uh, Russia is no different from any other post-Soviet country and we must state it very clearly that if force is used against those who demonstrate, we will react very strongly and we need to mark the line here in this chamber and we must be sure that we all think in the same, along the same lines, no matter which side of the chamber we are on. And I believe that Mr. Svoboda also agrees with that and it should be stated very clearly from this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Mr. Scholz. President. Thank you very much, President, Commissioner, Minister, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to address Mr. Swoboda. Your first draft resolution was very balanced and dispassionate in uh, what happened in the wake of the presidential elections. The Russian government has committed itself through its signature to the Human Rights Convention uh, uh, to keep to certain obligations they're not keeping to. These elections were not free and fair once again, they were not free of fraud. Not even 300 million euros of investments of the government in surveillance techniques have resolved the problems that can only be resolved politically. Those are the sober facts that we as partners can't uh, remain, uh, can't ignore really. They really make clear the paradoxes in a Russian society that is obviously changing. This is something we should welcome and support because democracy thrives on str struggling at, to find alternatives and, the, and striving for development and changes through protest as well. Russia is becoming normal and that's why I'd like to see some of the uh, conclusions that some of my colleagues here have drawn are really wrong. This house has to finally decide which line it's going to follow. In the ALDA event, uh, Russia after the elections, what I took with me was that part, some of our colleagues believe Russia is no longer normal. Was it once normal? And that it constitutes a danger and it, we can't have business as usual because now we have to see a different procedure taking place. Maybe I can just squander one word on this. If you want to think in this spiral of escalation, maybe you can now e explain how far you want to go in doing that. And also, what's going to happen to partnership in all this? With all the justifiable criticism and the differences that exist, partnership, for me, means uh, con reconciling com common interests. And in my mother tongue, at least, partnership and subordination are not syn synonyms. If you want to go along that path, then that tells me very clearly you don't believe in the power of change of a society and that changes in the Russian society have not been noted. And these 
changes in society are things we see reflected in the uh, electoral observation missions of the Council of Europe and ODIA as well because they are providing alternatives to uh, Putin's uh, steered democracy. This has to be discussed in political terms, but sometimes I hear the discussion in this uh, House as being quite strange. I think it's important for the political dignity uh, of this House, and you can't reconcile that with the plurality in this House when you, when you hear some of the representatives of the Russian opposition here in Strasbourg talking about some of the other uh, alternative candidates who got more than 25 million votes of the citizens of Russia in the elections and describe them as Putin's pigs. Again, against better knowledge, people in this House, unchallenged, talk for weeks about the possibility of bloodletting through Putin and a possible re re revolution. I can say that that is not something that the clear majority in uh, this House would like to express by way of criticism against the elections in Russia. Next speaker is uh, Madame Tsavela. Thank you, Mr. President. If one looks at the effectiveness of the institutions that have been set up between the EU and Russia, one has to say that very little progress has been made as far as bringing the two, parts, two parties closer together. Why is that the case? We must be making a mistake somewhere and the other side making mistakes too. We need to be effective as far as building up the relations between the EU and Russia is concerned. If we really want to cooperate with Russia, and I think we absolutely do, then we need carefully to plan new methods to bring the two sides together. We've had the good news that Russia was joining the WTO. That was a big step forward. Up to now, what the EU and the EP has been doing is simply accusing Russia about what's going on there. We're just being critical and that doesn't get us anywhere. On the contrary, I think it slows down and makes the two sides rapproche more, more difficult. We are looking at Russia from a unilateral standpoint and we are moving further away from real cooperation. As far as energy, trade, culture are concerned, if we really want to move things forward, and indeed in human rights as well, we need to adopt a different approach. Let me tell you about a personal experience of mine, Mr Chairman. I uh, was talking to one of the Arab leaders who had come back from Moscow and he said that Putin told him that the Europeans want to tell us how to govern our country. There is a big cultural difference between the EU and other countries. We are the people who should be striking steps in order to make the relations between the two sides easier. Thank you, President. Next speaker is Mr. Meltzer for one minute. Thank you, Pre Thank you President. President, we all know that in Russia there are deficits in democracy and uh, human rights. But the root of the uh, former mother country of uh, socialism uh, towards democracy is a long one and Russia can't be measured with Western measures but I think that the uh, new presidency of Putin offers an opportunity to take a further step to further democracy there is a chance that the uh, arrest of uh, political prisons prisoners uh, can be reviewed and uh, the non-registration of political parties could be reviewed and uh, combating uh, corruption. We should give Russia that chance. And I think that we Europeans uh, shouldn't uh, uh, wag our um, finger. Uh, there are enough uh, uh, democratic deficits in the EU itself. Just recently, Mr. Van Rompuy, 
without any uh, democratic, uh, his, his uh, period in office was uh, just uh, extended without any legitimacy. Madame Oymen Ruitem. Yeah, near the foot. President, we as a parliament justifiably levelled a lot of criticism as to the way in which the Duma elections were held. And what struck me uh, in the presidential elections, they hadn't learnt anything. On the day of the elections, maybe it was a bit more normal, but the day after, when it came to tell, uh, telling, uh, um, counting the, the votes, we, you know, it was suddenly back to business as usual. Now, Russia, as a country in the Council of Europe, shouldn't be allowed to do this. They have to keep, keep to the rules. President, there are nevertheless some glimmers of hope. I've never seen a situation where such a peaceful opposition, such peaceful uh, civil society uh, demonstrating on the str streets, and that seems that... Uh, there, there was little violence there in, in any case. What we need to make sure is that we defend those people, those people who are demonstrating peacefully and also work together with those people in the Duma or in the Kremlin who are hap happy to work together with us on, on that basis. And that's really what's reflected in the text of our resolution. What Mr. Swoboda is proposing here, I think, is something that we can all support on the other issues in a few months Mr. Swoboda will be producing a new text and I think the new text can be refined even more. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech and next speaker is Mr. Fleckenstein. Uh, President. President, colleagues, I'm convinced that the route to more democracy in Russia uh, can't be stopped anymore. But I'm also convinced that our parliament, our groups, the parties behind them, the foundations can do a lot more and must do a lot more to be good friends and advisers for Russia. Since the Duma election there's been uh, a large number of demonstrations. The efforts by civil society uh, have increased significantly. It isn't just uh, party politicians on the streets. It's also a number of uh, citizens, more and more from the, from the middle, uh, well-educated people, people uh, who've um, traveled and been educated abroad. We must have a dialogue with them. We must uh, establish contacts with them and make sure there is more people-to-people more, uh, -people contacts, also by uh, working on the... Um, open questions uh, on uh, visa freedom. We also need to intensify the parliamentarian uh, dialogue. Uh, we, are, we need more talks, not less, with colleagues from the State Duma to discuss and to convince them. We can uh, offer our experience. We ought to make our uh, opinion clear so that the colleagues there can learn from our experiences and learn from the errors that we've made and uh, the, the errors that we'll make in future to avoid them. We can do that through clear talks and uh, by, by not uh, talking down to them um, in the way that we tend to do sometimes in this House. The Partnership for Modernization is a good instrument for that. If we all agree that uh, economic and technical uh, modernization isn't enough, but rather a modernization of uh, law, politics and society. With that, w without that, uh, our partnership won't be successful. And next speaker is Mr. McMillan Scott for two minutes. Thank you, President. It's quite clear that uh, Mr. Putin has no friends in this chamber, even though Mr. Svoboda believes somehow that Mr. Medvedev's promises will turn into reality. But Mr. Koval says that we should tell it like it is. And our resolution uh, would be a credit to Cathy Ashton. And I believe that the European Parliament should stop business as usual with the Putin regime. I think the EU should stop playing it safe. I think we should use all the measures at our command. 
to put pressure on the Putin regime for genuine reform. We should stop discussing fruitless treaties and start being unsafe. And let's start with the chamber next door. Mr. Koval, in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, David Cameron's MPs, 18 of them, sit with 16 members of the United Russia Party from the Duma. Now this House has recommended that the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe should regard the Duma delegation as illegitimate. Let's, as you say, tell it like it is. And let's start at home. In the European Union, where people play games with politics. And you've said that the European Union is losing respect. Yes, because we don't tell it like it is. So let's start here. And the next resolution we pass on Russia should not be something that looks like it comes from the EAS, but something that comes from the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. No blue cards. OK, let's continue. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Kaminski. President, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me tell you that Mr. Paweł Kowal is no longer a member of the Law and Justice Party in Poland, similar to myself, and we do not really appreciate the fact that the members of this Polish party are, together, are sitting together with a uh, single Russia party deputies. Uh, let me say also that what is happening today in Russia must raise our concerns concerning the democratic nature of this country, of this state. Today we have no doubts as to the fact that these elections were not true elections and that the opposition in Russia is being persecuted. And that it's not only about vote counting, although every day we hear new information about vote counting being uh, unfair and uh, about irregularities in this respect. But democracy is not merely about the technical process of voting and vote counting. Democracy is also about everything that surrounds the vote, freedom of media, freedom of political parties, freedom of speech. And this is what is lacking in Russia. So even if the fair vote were gar voting was were to be guaranteed in Russia, even then we could not talk about fair elections in Russia because all other, is, other aspects are not democratic in Russia. Today the European Union should act decisively in its political activities because the Russian nation deserves freedom and we wish this nation to achieve this freedom. Minsky and next speaker is Mr. Griffin. Mr. President. As an observer in Moscow at the Duma elections, I witnessed a robust system which is far more democratic than the fraud-ridden shambles in Britain. If observers come to elections in London this May, they will find hundreds of thousands of non-existent ghosts voting by post without any kind of ID check. They will see flimsy cardboard ballot boxes with voting papers falling out of gaps at the bottom, mainly under the control of appointees of Baroness Ashton's Labour Party. At least the Russians have elections. Baroness Ashton became one of the most powerful figures in post-democratic Europe without a single vote. And who elected the technocrats, now asset-stripping, occupied Greece and Italy? We all know the real reasons for the attacks on Putin. George Soros and his banker friends want to privatise and loot Russia, just like they're looting the West. So forget about the specks of dust in Mr Putin's eye and remove the giant planks of electoral fraud and elite greed from the European Unions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next speaker is Mr Brock. Uh, President, Herr Kommissar. President, Commissioner, President in office, well, hearing speeches like the previous one, I see that uh, people have misunderstood the values here. If you think that Britain is not a full democracy, that's one thing. But if you think that Putin is a model for democracy, then really there are all sorts of things I no longer understand in this world. Ladies and gentlemen, 
In the Duma elections, I think it was a case of fraudulent elections, and I think in the Duma elections and the presidential elections, oppositional candidates who were critical of the regime had no opportunity to be elected because they weren't accepted as candidates. And we've seen there's a new middle class that orientates itself around striving for freedom and a modern democratic state under the rule of law and wants to have an economically sound uh, middle class based four square society is something that they want we should support them these people are looking to the future of Russia in the interest of Russia Mr. Medvedev made an offer to the non-oppositional non-existent oppositional party uh, to make progress in his working group and we need to note whether there is going to be any novelties in what's going to be implemented by the new president and this is really what we're driving at in our resolution we want to note if promises are going to be kept if they're going to be implemented if the path to reform is going to be taken that's really landed on the lap of president putin and it's something that will be a feather in his hat if he achieves that if not we'll see russia remain and develop into an even more dictatorial regime uh, which is an aberration and we'll have to see once again whether M mr putin is going to be dealing with the opposition in a fair way as well and next speaker is mr yustas palechkis Oh, sorry, blue card. Would you like to answer for blue card, Mr. Brock? Yeah, okay. Mr. Schulz. Kollege Brock, you have. Colleague Brock, you said rightly that the Duma election were uh, fraudulent based on the, all the information we have, and you expressed the hope that this working group set up by President Medvedev to work on a new electoral law and to um, uh, have simplifal, simplified admission of parties will be fruitful. Will you support the um, uh, resolution tomorrow? That's the base, on the basis of this uh, Medvedev uh, working group uh, to have uh, uh, early Duma elections. Adler, short. Uh, uh, Kollege Brock. Um. Kollege Brock, I'd like to ask you if together with your uh, colleague Gardini, uh, I spoke with her, who, was, who, who met uh, observers uh, on this, in this presidential election and said at a pre press conference that this, this election was free and fair. Also, Mr. Brock. Well, I don't know that statement, but if that's a statement that's been made, then I can denounce that as nonsense because, you know, Nobody has a monopoly over nonsense in uh, the political parties. Now, Mr. Schultz, um, we'll see what forms, of re what forms of reform will be adopted and we'll be able to draw lessons from that. I think, first of all, it's important that the conditions be put in place so that there can uh, be a state under the rule of law. That Now, the uh, issues of parties being e more easily accepted and uh, signatures recognized, there need to be fewer signatures required. It has to be necessary that media freedom thrives so that parties, opposition parties have better chances. These are some of the conditions which are necessary to see further democratic developments in Russia. And I think the rather weak conclusion of that is that we need to take one step after the other. Let's not try and uh, run before we can walk. For your answer, and next speaker is Mr. Palechkis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the last three months, I had an opportunity to observe Duma and presidential elections in Rus Russia. Uh, despite the fact that uh, during elections to the Duma, in one of the electoral stations, I witnessed electoral fraud, which was caught on camera by one of the members of the electoral commission members, I had mainly positive impression in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, I saw a huge interest from the part of the society and a sincere desire, especially on the part of the youth, to prevent electoral fraud. Especially, this was demonstrated by opposition observers and candidates. It is therefore to be very much regretted that uh, a number of opposition candidates were prevented 
and also opposition parties were prevented from participating. Uh, the government party and government candidate had uh, the exclusive, let's say, greenhouse conditions in the elections, whereas the opposition had to endure a completely different climate. Nevertheless, that desire to hold a fair and just election has permitted hundreds of thousands of Russian citizens, which has been demonstrated by demonstrations in Moscow. According to opinion polls, 10 years ago, about 20% of the electorate would be in favor of the European way, whereas now that figure would be about 30% and 50% if we take only young people. However, we should bear in mind that about 40% would be in favor of the so-called special Russian way, which is not in line with the democratic principles. Therefore, I support the colleagues which are in favor of intensifying relations with Russia and um, directing Russia to the European values and European principles. One minute. Thank you, President. I don't want to repeat everything that has been said so far. I believe that almost everyone agrees that the situation is bad. The elections were not fair, were not free. There have been some speakers who said today that progress has been made. I do not believe that. I don't think you do either. But let us now touch upon the procedure. I think the motion for the resolution wasn't really proceed, uh, proceed in a way that would be easy for everyone. And I think Mr. McMillan Scott mentioned uh, some concerns. I think the resolution should be stronger. This is the task of the European Parliament. And it is my honor now to urge you to support three amendments by the ECR that would strengthen this weak resolution. And I count on your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stadler, for one minute. Uh, President. President, this Parliament and most of the speakers in this Parliament act as if uh, the R Russian citizens are children. Uh, that isn't the case. Russians know very well who they want to elect and who not, and they wanted stability. That was borne out with lots of talks uh, that I had with Russian um, citizens on the street. Um, and that, that's what I heard from the citizens themselves. Stability. They don't want to return to the uh, d times they had under the Yeltsin government. I was an election observer. observer. I met uh, only one other member. That was Mrs. Gardini from the EPP group. And I myself uh, went to, the, uh, uh, to a province 1,200 kilometers from Moscow. There were uh, election observers uh, of Mr. Zuganov in particular, Mr. Uh, Zirinovsky and Mr. Prokhorov. There were uh, commissions, there were uh, uh, transparent uh, sealed uh, bar ballot boxes, in, there were webcams there so that uh, yeah, at home you could observe the elections yourself. Uh, all the claims about the election in Russia as, uh, is not true based on my experience. I want to, or wouldn't like to say anything about the Duma election, but I saw the presidential election uh, myself and it isn't true what's being said here. Thank you. Will you accept blue card? Okay, Mr. Migalski. Thank you very much. I fully agree that Russians are not small children. I'm fully convinced that most Russians are wiser than you are. I'm convinced of that. My question is as follows. Do you know how the media market functions in Russia? How many free uh, broadcasting stations are there are in Russia? Thank you. A colleague, this, a colleague the, this media market market doesn't, it isn't much different than the Austrian one. Um, we had a, a state monopoly um, up to t 10 years ago in Austria and nobody said in this parliament anything about Austria because of that. We had uh, uh, reporting in state uh, um, TV which was uh, almost all about the government. So I know all about that. It's denigrating that uh, nothing, if what, whatever, uh, that isn't in line with the mainstream of this House uh, is uh, dismissed as nonsense, uh, as Mr. Brock said and Mrs. Morgantini. Uh, I saw the things myself and, uh, I, uh, and I can't be um, persuaded otherwise because I saw it myself. Next speaker is Mr. Lisek. Thank you, President, Minister, Commissioner. 
Just one remark to begin with concerning the procedure. I'd like to say that I wanted to submit my blue card twice. Unfortunately, President didn't notice that I wanted to refer to Mr. Motor and Fleckenstein's interventions. But now I have the floor and I'd like to use this opportunity. What I'd like to say is this. I'd like to refer to what Mr. Fleckenstein said. I hope that you believe that it's not only the Duma that we sh should lead dialogue with, especially in this situation where the opposition was pushed out of the Duma. Some opposition candidates were not even let to be candidates. And I believe that this dialogue should be pursued with the political forces outside the Russian parliament. They are now the new emergent political forces or they are NGOs, associations and the like. I hope that you believe that we should conduct dialogue with them as well. One more remark regarding the resolution. We are addressing President Medvedev, but I think we should note that President Medvedev wasn't really the person taking all the strategic decisions concerning Russian policy during his term of office. And now he's an outgoing president. So I think we should address all our resolutions to President Putin that is going to hold power very soon. Thank you. Uh, sorry for this first blue card. I saw only one and I gave you just now more time for, for your speech. Uh, next speaker, Mr. Zala. Thank you, colleagues. Many have argued that the <coughs> EU should radically rethink its Russia policy, that it cannot be business as usual after months of protests and Vladimir Putin's return to the Kremlin after the presidential elections. Let me say that such a policy shift would be a strategic blunder. The EU should continue to do what it is doing, only do it better. Our current approach, a strategic but critical engagement with Russia, remains sound, although it is working. I agree with my colleague Fleckenstein that what is happening in Russia today is a political awake awakening of the middle class. The ever louder demands for political reform in Russia are a direct consequence of its economic prosperity and openness to the world. But that prosperity and openness is in large part due to the density and volume of the EU-Russia interactions, investments, trade, tourism and all that. We need more of that, including in the future visa-free travel. Colleagues, I am not saying, saying that we shouldn't be critical of the Russian government whenever it dis disregards human rights or fail to uphold the principles of rule of law and democracy. But in the end, constructive engagement will do more to advance our values in Russia than tough talk in rigid positions. Therefore, I would say that recent events in Russia and the presidential elections actually present a case for staying the course in terms of our policy. In that framework, I support the resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Madame Neisky. Thank you. A generation ago, the principled position of Europe in protection of human rights has helped in bringing down the Berlin Wall. Two decades later, the challenges that Europe is facing is that democracy and freedom continue to be a priority and that there is no political conjecture considerations which will replace it. European leaders have to prove that before their own electorate and some of it has been asking the question whether the time of division provided more comfort. European leaders owe that proof to the reformists in the European in the Arab Spring who have started to believe in democracy rather than in geographical uh, belonging to Europe. Those who believe in democracy in Russia, who 
protested against violations of human rights and manipulated elections and repression against the media. Those who demanded laws against corruption are owed that. And we believe that Europe shall support uh, Russia's strive for changes rather than making recommendations which are not binding. As a trade partner of Russia and an attractive center for flights of capital, we have to stand behind basic hu human rights and democratic principles should be at the heart of cooperation with Russia. Mr. Tabaidi. Thank you very much. Uh, we have heard uh, legitimate concerns and criticisms, but I wouldn't like to use a tone of, uh, of, uh, of the teacher of, of tutoring tone because that would be counterproductive. In terms of the access to the media and coverage, there is no, there are no equal opportunities. That is evident from the campaign. But it's a fact that the president of Russia is called Vladimir Putin. It is him with whom we have to cooperate and collaborate. As The question if Putin's reform in terms of the political institutions or in terms of the economy is an open question. It is primarily the interest of Russia, but also that of Europe to see it uh, succeed. The Putin system has used up its sources. There needs to be more democracy, more freedom, and in economical terms, Russia is lagging behind the other BRIC countries. If the Russian economy doesn't see a, a fundamental reform, then uh, tensions will build up which will endanger social stability. The interest of European Union is to have a stable and modernized Russia. Thank you very much. And next speaker is Ms. Madame Kolarska-Bobinska. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Colleagues, uh, for the elections to be truly fair, uh, full access must be granted to all, all candidates, not only those whose uh, authorities are allowed to take part. Also, in this sense, the recent presidential elections are neither fair nor democratic. Nevertheless, a majority of the Russian people continue to support Vladimir Putin, now president, before prime minister, before president. Uh, feeling that support, the rulers in Kremlin must realize that lack of democracy breeds corruption and deprives the citizens of their dignity. Events in North Africa and Middle East are showing that sooner or later people will rebel against corruption and will come out on the streets to demand to be treated with respect. The same is true of Russia. And the democratic reforms are essential in Russia if future turbulence is to be avoided. Turbulence different than recent peaceful demonstrations. And I think this is one of the results of these elections. Thank you very much. Million. Thank you very much. And just now we'll go to the KDI. I have eight. And uh, the first will be Mr. Milan. Milan. Yeah. Thank you, President. Russia is very important to the EU, a neighboring European country, a global player, and a standing member of the UNSC. That's why we want to have close relations with Russia to deal with matters of mutual interest as well as for global governance. But there are problems in the way of these close relations. We can't be happy with the way Russia's behaved in the Syria crisis. And we've had recent events, the Duma elections in December and the presidential elections on the 4th of this month, which really have made some of us very concerned. These elections weren't up to the standards of a com country that's a member of the uh, Council of Europe and the OSCE. A fundamental element in our relations, therefore, need to be shared common values, respect for human rights, a multi-party state and respect for democratic participation. The modern Russia that we want needs to be a Russia of shared European values. On that basis, we can build the intense relations that, that we want. Thank you, President. The speaker is Madame Kretu. 
Domnule președinte, o primă con Thank you very much, President. Uh, first conclusions, uh, conclusion from the demonstrations in Russia is that the civil society is stronger and can offer an alternative to the current government. As for our relations with the Kremlin, we need to be pragmatic. We should not compromise on our political and moral values. Russia must know that our po position on human rights and on democracy and transparency is non-negotiable. The European Union has to explain very clearly to Moscow that Moscow's position on Syria is not supportive of the people. The new administration should condemn what is going on in Syria, especially in the UN. The European Union and the member states should speak with the same voice when we're talking about the essential dimensions of relations with Russia, such as energy. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. For many of us who uh, lived under the shadow of Russia during the communist regime, the result of these elections is the election of Vladimir Putin as president. I uh, don't want to um, look at things from a single perspective. Russia will be uh, for a very long time between Asian modernity and European democracy. What is certain is that the 30% of the Russian citizens who are motivated to elect, uh, to choose the European model deserve our investment. And I would like to emphasize that our partnership with Russia should be focused on strengthening civil society and on strengthening the opposition, which we hope will no longer be divided. As regards the elections, they were neither free nor transparent in agreement with our standards. We don't have to judge the elections only uh, from the day of the vote, but also taking into account the general framework. If our partnership remains a privileged policy, we should continue with realism. Thank you. And next speaker is Madame Andrikiene. Thank you, Mr. President. European Union, as Russia's direct neighbor, has followed with particular interest the election process and widespread ongoing protests in Russia on both the State Duma and presidential elections. We observed the so-called carousel voting on the election day, vote fraud, as irregularities and shortcomings reported by international observers. Taking all this into account, as well as the announcement of potentially competitive candidates, also TV broadcasting during the election campaign by 90% dominated by one candidate, we cannot draw any other conclusion than, firstly, presidential elections were neither free nor fair. Consequently, the legitimacy of the president-elect is questionable. Secondly, Russian people are fighting for free elections and they deserve our support and solidarity. And finally, arrests of dozens of peaceful protesters across Russia during demonstrations after the disputed victory of Vladimir Putin deserve our condemnation. The, all this has to be stated in our resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next speaker is Mr. Pashka. Thank you very much, President. Russia, in political and economic terms, is the most important neighbor of the EU. The presidential elections in this country constitute a very important choice of the citizens over the ca character of the nature, uh, uh, the character of the country. And uh, the president has a lot of power in his hands. Vladimir Putin was the clear winner of the elections, um, but there are reservations from the opposition. The leaders of the opposition are only supported to a de slight degree by the population. There are questions over the uh, freeness and fairness of the elections, and this has been reflected in by the uh, foreign observers, but none of the other opponents had any chance to win the elections. There doesn't seem to be any important power in Russia apart from uh, that, that would constitute an alternative to Putin. In a healthy society, there has to be an open political dialogue. There has to be an open media landscape as well. And for this reason, we should give Russia this chance as well to make sure that the opposition can actually fulfill their true potential. Thank you very much.
Minister, Commissioner. Substantial part of Russian citizens have clearly told that's enough. What the EU has now to take as a basis for its further relationship with Russia is the fact that both the new parliament as well as president have lost political credibility. Therefore, the least this parliament can do, can do is to declare clearly and firmly that these elections have been not fair nor free. But the question is what next? Can we rely upon the promises expressed by Mr. Medvedev or Putin for electoral reform? I think our chance is the opportunity to try to bring together the Russian opposition as well as present leadership to work out a national compromise, but it should be a constructive compromise, to set a date for new elections after the new reform. Thank you very much. And next speaker is Mr. Dr Brons. Thank you. So we're all supposed to get exercised about the state of democracy in Russia. In fact, the enemies of democracy are much closer to home. In 2004, Belgium banned the Flams Bloc, as though banning political parties were quite consistent with democracy. In Germany in 2001, there are attempts to ban the MPD on the basis of evidence that was found by the Constitutional Court to have been fabricated by state agents. Was this in Communist East Germany? No, it was in the Federal Republic. In the UK, the BBC is a law unto itself. If you're an establishment stooge, you have unlimited access. If you're a genuine opponent of the establishment, you're talked about but rarely given access. At least the internet's free, or so we thought. However, yesterday in this chamber, we saw establishment pos uh, politicians and an EU commissar, yes, you did hear that correctly, drooling about the possibility of using EU and Dutch law to close down the website of the Dutch Freedom Party and prosecute and jail its leader. Thank you. Okay, next speaker is Madame Yakonsari. President, it's been said here that democracy, democracy is a process, and that was widely said. Democracy is a, a, a road. It isn't a simple destination, because uh, democracy isn't perfect in any country. One precondition for democracy is that uh, uh, a people uh, works through uh, also the uh, dark sides of its history. Uh, that's the case uh, in Germany, uh, where they have their own term for, term for it, for Gangenheitsbewältigung. But in Russia, this hasn't been done yet. For example, when you ask Russian young people what uh, are their uh, ideals, a large part of uh, a large number of young people will say Stalin. But uh, the de development of democracy uh, in Russia means that they work through their own uh, dark history, and through that, uh, uh, they will uh, re have uh, appreciation of democracy and diversity. We can just now finish our procedure, gauge the eye. Oh, sorry, sorry, I have one more, Mr. Silvestris. Thank you, President. I'll vote along group lines tomorrow, but I do have some differences from my group position. Parliament observers saw that the Russian areas did have full guarantees for the electors when they were voting and a guarantee of confidentiality in the vote itself. This even was even distance control was possible there. President Putin's a vital figure in Russia and he did win by a large margin but that doesn't necessarily mean that the vote was a fraud. And don't forget that people were left free to protest and have been on the streets doing exactly that. Pre president Putin has been re-elected as president whether we like it or not. Thank you. Darren, do you have a blue card? No, no. KGDI was finished. Sorry for that. To conclude, I would like to give the floor to the representative of the Vice President of the Commission, High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, to Minister Soundal. Mr. Soundal, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'll speak in Danish now. Uh, first of all, Mr. Sack, for. First of all, 
Uh, thank you for all the analyses. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you for all the uh, suggestions. It was interesting to listen to the debate, and I'll make sure that uh, uh, those views are taken forward to uh, Catherine Ashton so she can be inspired by them. I have three final remarks. First of all, I think that everybody uh, in the EU is disappointed about what you could call the uh, manipulation ahead of this uh, election. The, the lack of uh, recognition of candidates was one thing, partly in the form of uh, the uh, lack of uh, uh, equal access to the media and the examples that have been seen of uh, fraud where there has been man manipulation of the uh, electoral outcome itself. It has been criticized, criticized by the e EU too. It's important that we continue our criticism to get the Russians to uh, have more free and fair elections. Russia has committed itself vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the uh, Council of Europe and the OSCE recommendations to carry out free and fair elections. I would like to underline we can't, we don't do that if we, we take the situation now and uh, uh, think of where we want to go. It's, it, we do that by having uh, a dialogue. We don't need less dialogue, we need more dialogue to make sure that the Russians uh, will place themselves where we would like them to be in this issue. Uh, but at the same time, this has been part of the debate today, we must uh, be aware of the positive elements uh, which uh, we see in this election. First of all, Medvedev has uh, promised to uh, contact the Russian opposition. We think that this is uh, um, uh, an outstretched hand, partly uh, international. Uh, uh, there were more uh, observers than before. Uh, in the past it was difficult uh, to have observers. This time it was uh, uh, possible. That's also a step forward. The uh, civil uh, participation in elections in a number of areas uh, was, a pro was progress compared to uh, the past. The uh, popular demonstrations are a sign of a living democracy where the people have the right and possibility to demonstrate. This is a new situation. We should use this and we should use that to uh, exert pressure for economic and political modernization of Russian society. We, can, we should use that to have contact to all parts of Russian society. We should make sure that uh, we set in train and continue to have contact in a number of areas with Russia. I believe that uh, we will make most progress by continue by continuing uh, dialogue, uh, as it's been pointed out by many people today, uh, uh, there's a number of international uh, connections. Uh, it's important for Russia uh, to play along. You can mention uh, Syria, I Iran. You can mention the uh, discussion on uh, Rio plus 20. We, we need to have Russia closer uh, to us uh, in uh, uh, democratic control, and we must make uh, further efforts on that. Thank you for the debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Um, I have got only one suggestion for uh, resolution at the end of uh, our debate. And uh, I would like to state that the debate is closed. Uh, voting will be tomorrow at 12 o'clock. The next point on our agenda is the statement by the Vice President of the Commission, High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and the Security Policy on Kazakhstan. And again, uh, Minister Sondal has uh, the uh, floor uh, as a representative of the High Representative. Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, again, Mr. President and honourable members of the European Parliament. It's again a pleasure on behalf <coughs> of uh, the High Representative, Vice President Aston, uh, to deal about the latest developments uh, on EU activities in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is a key player <coughs> 
in the wider region of Central Asia and an influential actor on the international fora. It has recently held the chairmanship of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, and the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, OIC. Since, since its dependence 20 years ago, <coughs> it has been the European Union's policy to support Kazakhstan's economic and political progress. The EU has a strategic interest to further deepen our involvement with Kazakhstan and to fully develop mutual pol political cooperation potentials, especially considering the rapidly evolving regional integration dynamics. Kazakhstan is a pragmatic partner, open to reform and willing to explore op opportunities. The EU is also an important trade and investment part partner for Kazakhstan. The recent start of negotiations on a new enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement with Kazakhstan was a signal of the importance that the EU attached to its cooperation with Kazakhstan. However, strengthening EU-Kazakhstan relation does not and cannot occur independently from the progress of political reforms in Kazakhstan. The respect for common values of democracy, rule of law and human rights are the basic for deepening our relations. This is a statement we jointly made with Kazakhstan in 2009 and we stand by it. Therefore, we maintain our position that a success of negotiations on the new agreement will be influenced by the advancements of political reforms and fulfilment of Kazakhstan's international commitments. In this context, we are concerned about the recent developments on the overall slow progress of political reform in Kazakhstan, including the limited implementation of international commitments. According to independent observers from the OSCE, both the early presidential and early parliamentary elections in 2011 and 2012 fell short of meeting democratic principles. For the first time since Kazakhstan's independence, we have seen high social tension, tensions, including a number of terrorist attacks. The strike of oil workers that started in May 2011 culminated to violent clashes with the police in December 2011 resulting in seven dead, 17 dead and about 110 injured. To cope with evolving security challenges and threats, the Kazakh government amended a number of laws over the past few months. It has introduced changes that seem to empower the state more and more while restricting the, right, the rights and freedoms of citizens, civil society and political opposition. The High Representative, Vice President, received several questions from honourable members of the Parliament about these developments and about the EU's approach, opinions and actions taken.